let's get going um, on our exciting morning session. Uh, we're starting today with the body map session, which continues with the variant to function theme, looking specifically at the molecular characterization of cells in their native um, tissue context. So the body ma map project aims to develop a multimodal and multi-ancestry cell and tissue map with a global scope. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, who's um, Dr. Kristen Audley. Uh, Dr. Audley is a scientist at the Broad Institute, where she led the genotype tissue, tissue expression, the GTEx project, and is now working on two extensions of these um, efforts, the developmental GTEx project and the non-human primate developmental G, uh, GTEx project. She serves on two working groups for the Human Cell Atlas, is a member of the HCA's Genetic Diversity Bionetwork, and led technical methods development for single-cell analyses of biobank tissues from GTEx. Kristen is a co-lead along with Dr. Tuli Lapalainen of ICDA's um, Body Map Working Group. Great, thanks. Over to you, Kristen. Okay, thank you. Um, and I want to start with apologies to my colleagues who work on uh, cells and uh, blood-based PBMC studies, and I am going to abashedly talk only about tissues and ignore a lot of what you've done, other than to acknowledge that you have led the way, paved the way with methods development, both in the lab and analytically. Um, so thank you, but your life is much, much easier. Um, So I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of tissue-based reference projects. The first one, obviously, is the GTEx, or Genotype Tissue Expression Project, that I've been engaged with since the start, with several people here as well. Um, effect, essentially, this project was launched in 2010, and this shows the rough timeline of it through its publications to its final consortium publication, which was based on the V8 data and came out in 2020. This is not the final data set. We have actually had a release that included additional, a final set of genotypes just this last year. And there are a few more sets of data still straggling out. Probably most of those will come out in the spring of this year. Uh, by all accounts, this has been an incredibly successful project. Uh, there are close to 1,000 approved access requests for the raw data, and there are 227 NIH-funded projects at present that either use or reference the data um, that have been successfully funded. Even more people use the, the derived data that's available on the portal. We had 1.8 million page views last year uh, from to close to 250,000 separate users spanning 173 countries. Uh, at the last time we checked, back in the fall, there were over 1,400 papers uh, indexed in PubMed using GTEx data, 30,000 Google Scholar references, um, and because the project created a biobank of residual samples, to date there have been at least 183 requests to use those samples to add on additional data types primarily. So the goal of that project when it started was to link non-coding regulatory variation to genes and mechanisms, what we've been talking about in the V2 context in this meeting so far. And the hypothesis was these, these functional effects of these non-coding variants is through changes in these molecular phenotypes shown here, and particularly ones like gene expression that we can measure in a population sample. To do this, uh, we knew at the outset that we needed to measure this in two dimensions. It was important to look in tissues across individuals because the effects of these regulatory variants are different in the different tissues and cell types, and the consequences on the, the phenotype or diseases are clearly, clearly tissue-specific, so we needed to look within tissues. And we also needed to measure these effects across individuals so we could assess that genetic diversity across individuals. This is basically the, the pipeline. These are the tissues we collected shown here on the individuals. And these are the key features of the pipeline. Firstly, we had a large number of donors, so we could assess diversity. And here, I just mean that gen genetic diversity across individuals. We collected multiple normal tissues per donor. And we did this by collecting tissues from recently deceased organ donors <clears throat> and rapid autopsy donors. We had high quality of the tissues uh, measured by low ischemic times and other quality metrics. We had consent that allowed for general research use and active donor engagement. In this case, it was next of kin donor engagement in the project. We had an accuracy of tissue sampling sites because these were all 
decided up front so that we would sample the same tissue site in the same way across different donors. Um, and those were done with respect to anatomical coordinate references. And we had consistency in that sampling from site to site and donor to donor because of extensive training in how to sample these tissues. We also had extensive metadata spanning medical, um, histology, pathology, and analytical uh, variables as well. The core data types produced were genotypes uh, as whole genome sequencing on every individual and bulk RNA-seq of all of the tissues and the cell lines that were created. This project started prior to single cell, so everything was done in bulk tissues. And the final data produced was an atlas of gene expression across all these tissues shown in this figure here, and expression quantitative trait loci and the V8 sample size spanned 17,000 tissue samples from these 54 different sites and 838 donors. So in the high-level summary, what we found in V8 was that these genetic effects on expression and splicing are widespread. You can see local genetic variation regulating almost all genes. You can see we're saturating in expression at the round circles and splicing at the bottom. The study was also large enough to reliably identify some trans expression, QTLs, trans e-genes, um, but it was still underpowered for those and we're definitely not saturated and the effect of most of those was weak as well. These large sample sizes did enable discovery of weaker cis effects, however. Uh, the two graphs on the left show larger effect EQTLs as measured by allelic fold change, and you can see based on proportional numbers that we're saturating those at around uh, 300 samples. But on the right, for the smaller effect sizes, you can see there's no saturation of those weak effects, indicating we're underpowered and could use even more samples. But it may also be the case that these weak effects could be strong effects and cell type specific, and we're not seeing them in the heterogeneous tissues. We were able to discover multiple independent genetic effects on gene expression um, for many genes. And you can see these secondary signals are increasingly detected with large sample size. This graph on the bottom is sorted by sample size, uh, where to the right side of the graph, the, the larger tissues such as muscle. Um, and you can see there we're detecting four or more independent signals frequently with an average of about two per e gene. And regulatory variation also contributes to uh, genome-wide association signals. So we used a harmonized resource of 87 GWAS traits derived from the UK Biobank and other sources, and of the 5,000 plus GWAS loci we tested, approximately over 43% co-localized with a cis QTL and 23% with a cis splicing QTL. So expression and splicing do mediate these GWAS associations. There was considerable tissue sharing of, of this regulatory variation. As you can see here, this graph across the tissues is about as red or bright orange as you can get. There are these two different clusters. One is most of the tissues and the other is the brain, which is a little independent. And then the couple of columns on the left are actually blood and testes, which are generally outliers. Um, and the little U-shaped plot, interestingly, we saw that yesterday already, but you can see there's strong evidence for tissue sharing of these signals, but there's also tissue specificity at the other end. Um, so the question we have is, is this specificity and sharing driven by regulatory um, activity that's tissue specific, um, that's underlying by uh, tissue specific or shared cell types? To get at that question, um, we had to we approached it computationally because we didn't have single cell data. So we did a deconvolution of the bulk tissue into seven cell types that we could reliably um, uh, assess. Um, and then we wanted to ask if we look at enrichment of these cell types across the data, do we see a difference in these EQTL signals as shown by that cartoon? The little graph at the bottom shows you what they actually look like with the real data. And you, this is for keratinocyte uh, enrichment. You can see where it's enriched on the right-hand side. You see the EQTL signal quite clearly. Where it's not enriched and not present on the left-hand side, that signal is missing. And then we wanted to ask, are these interaction or cell type QTLs, um, do, the, do we find more co-localization of those with GWAS signals? And the answer to that is yes. So this is just one example where at the top here we have this GWAS signal, but immediately below it we see no co-localization co with the bulky QTL signal, but we do see co-localization with the interaction EQTL signal. 
So in summary, for 35% of GWAS loci, only an interaction QTL co-localized with the trait. We didn't see it with the bulky QTL signals. For an approximately additional 30% of loci, we saw a joint co-localization of both the interaction and the bulky QTL, which suggests uh, a cellular specificity to the trait. Um, and as you can see from this graph below, there's uh, clearly more tissue specificity for these interaction cell QTLs than there was for the bulk ones. So since I'm talking about cell level QTLs, I'm going to stop and switch and talk about another project, the Human Cell Atlas. Uh, and I'll thank Sarah Teichman for these slides. The Human Cell Atlas got going um, at about the time we were publishing the first pilot paper for GTEx. Um, and its mission is to create, was to create a comprehensive reference map of the cell types and properties of all human cells as the fundamental unit of life, basically as a, as a way to uh, clearly understand, diagnose, monitor, and treat health and disease. It's often referred to as the periodic table of the cells. You can see the cells represented here on the top. At the bottom, we have the networks that are contributing to this project, and the experimental and the computational methods. The experimental ones are based on um, imaging, single cell data, single attack, spatial data, and so on. This is the timeline of the human cell atlas. <clears throat> it began in 2016, essentially um, as a ground-up operation of many scientists and communities getting together, much in the same way that we're building ICDA. Um, and you can see as it progresses along, some of the first things were uh, uh, analysis working groups. We added on standards and technology and ethics and equity working groups. Um, and around 2019, the Pediatric Cell Atlas was started. Um, you can see that there was a blip of COVID-produced data, which as the rest of us were producing COVID-produced data, and you march along um, to the recent years, the last year or so, where we started to see publications of these tissue cell atlases. I've highlighted one here, the cross-tissue atlases, because I'll come back to those shortly. The HCA is a rapidly growing global and open scientific community. This is where it stands as of this last year. It spans 83 countries, 1,300-odd institutes, and 2,400-odd members. Um, and the, anyone can join, and there's the link below. It's also recently set up networks um, in different regions of the globe. So we heard about these yesterday. HCA Asia was the first to be established, followed by um, the uh, Latin America, and more recently, the HCA Africa. And we heard a little bit yesterday about the HCA Latin America and the work that they're doing. It's organized as a series of biological networks, which are largely tissue-focused or organ-focused, <clears throat> as you can see here. So there's groups that are focused on the heart and the cell types of the heart, the liver, the lung, and so on. There are a few exceptions to these. You can see there's a pediatric and developmental um, uh, network, which spans many tissues and looks more at the developmental component. And I want to point out this one here called the Genetic Diversity Bio Network, which is led by my colleague Cheyenne Prabhakar, who's going to be here as one of our panelists for the discussion. And this is a summary of where the HCA atlases are at this point. Um, there's 18 of those. They span 9,000 individuals, 173,000 samples, and to date they've uh, characterized over 109 million cells, and you can see that there's about 12, 12 million cells uh, in the COVID studies characterized. So I'm going to switch back to these cross-tissue atlases. Uh, just this last year, a set of uh, HCA cross-tissue atlases were published together in science, including one from Tabula sapiens, a cross-tissue immune network atlas, and one that we produced, which was a cross-tissue atlas based on tissues from GTEx. So our motivation in doing the GTEx study was obviously following on from the um, interaction QTLs and the uh, the 
the results where we were finding, indicating that cell type was the level we needed to be at when looking at EQTLs and genetic regulation. But also from studies from colleagues doing uh, working in blood that sh clearly showed that single cell RNA-seq enables identification of single cell EQTLs or cell type specific EQTLs. And that in doing that, we could identify weak signals that would be masked in bulk measurements and also find cell dependent state effects, um, many of which we heard about yesterday as well. So this was our study design. One of the things we knew up front was that if we were to launch this and do this in a population uh, based studies and to do it in tissues, then there was no way we were able to going to be able to do these studies on fresh cells. Um, we couldn't get the tissues close enough to where we needed to dissociate them in time, and we couldn't do large population scale studies in that way. So we had to be able to do these from banked biomaterials, so we asked the question, can we do this, and let's do it in GTEx. So we picked these eight tissue types for which we had frozen uh, samples available. We picked three individuals each per tissue, and because we didn't know what method was going to work, and we were just pioneering single nucleus methods at the time, with a REIT and a VIVE at the Broad, we decided to use three different protocols to see which worked. Um, and we profiled over 209,000 nuclei across these samples. And this is what the data looks like. Um, I think it looks beautiful. I, I love the color of this graph, or maybe I just like the colors. But you can clearly see the different uh, tissue types uh, th uh, that differ distinctly in their cellular composition. But you can also see within each tissue type the similarity across individuals and um, uh, methods as well. Our in our analysis, we actually did a, a joint analysis across all of these cell types and individuals, which allowed us to identify cell type uh, effects across tissues that are shared and specific. We were able to identify rare cell types th this way that we couldn't actually see within a given tissue. And we, were, we found tissue agnostic and tissue specific cell features for myeloid cells and fibroblasts. For instance, we found fibroblasts that were common to all the cell types and appeared to be um, uh, doing similar functions, as well as fibroblast populations that were quite specific and distinct in each of the tissue types. So I can't really talk about tissues without mentioning spatial, um, but I'm not going to talk too long about it. And when you're sampling tissues, spatial location matters within tissues. Um, so you need a framework of key anatomical landmarks to, t to say where you are. Um, if we're going to build a human reference atlas, um, and, this, and we need to integrate these with what's called the common coordinate frameworks and scaffolds, and these are being d uh, produced in studies such as the brain atlases, the human cell atlas, HubMap, and others. So you can see this picture here of, from LungMap on the left and the sampling sites shown in blue. Depending where you are, you're in a very different area despite being in the same tissue because cellular composition, cellular function, and cell-cell interactions clearly differ by location when you're in a tissue. In GTEx, we did this top-down approach for sampling, so we actually had very specific repeatable anatomic sampling in that project. And we had SOPs that described the precise site and location of where to sample in the tissue. So it occurred to us that we could probably map these to a common coordinate framework. Um, and HubMap has one of the key common coordinate frameworks. They have these beautiful 3D atlases of tissues. And you can see in this little video, you can take a tissue piece and place it where it's supposed to be with reference to anatomical landmarks. So we uh, collaborated with a group at HubMap and did this. And this is an example of mapping the GTEx transverse colon. On the left here is the sampling SOP that described in detail how and where to sample. You can see there's a piece of transverse colon shown in that picture, and we mapped it to the 3D body map in HubMap. So to date, we've gone ahead and done that for 27 different GTEx tissue extraction sites across males and females. You can see them as these little yellow dots in all these tissues here. Uh, they're visible if you go to HubMap, you can see the GTEx samples. You can also in GTEx see them from HubMap as well. Um, and the goal in doing this was for many of these tissues for which we don't yet have single cell data, you can go to this location and extract single cell or spatial data from other studies that are mapped to the same location. So hopefully this is integrating across resources and we'll create a bigger framework together. 
And I'm not going to talk about this at all, but sampling in sampling tissues, spatial location also matters to the cells within any one of these locations. Cells live with other cells um, that are similar, that are different. Adjacencies matter, so this level of spatial detail really matters when you're working in tissues. So where next? Obviously, from GTEx, we know that genetic regulatory variation is common in populations, and these tissue analyses are fundamental to and provide key insights into GWAS interpretation and functional mechanisms that are, can be very tissue and cell type specific. But if we're going to go on from this, we clearly need some, uh, some more things. Uh, what we need, and GTEx has taught us that, is we need single cell resolution of tissues and these multi-tissue approaches. GTEx, as I mentioned, was bulk uh, tissue. We didn't have these single cell approaches at that time. We also need large sample sizes of tissues plus genotypes to enable these genetic investigations. The human cell atlas is great in terms of its detail for tissue and cell sampling, but it doesn't have uh, a diversity of donors and most of them don't actually have genotypes available. We need multiomics, and we actually need a systematic approach to multiple molecular phenotypes, not just the transcriptome as we've been doing, but uh, the epigenome, methylation, proteomics, and we need enough materials to do that. In GTEx, we did this a bit haphazardly. We did RNA for everything. We added other cell types in extension projects, but they weren't systematic, and they need to be systematic. Cell lines are very valuable, we did collect them in these, and it's really key to be able to collect those so that we can bridge to other projects like the cell map. And then we need diversity in populations, geographies, and environment. And I'm going to finish here with a couple of slides uh, that are borrowed from my colleague Shyam, um, that he presented recently at a CZI meeting. As I mentioned, he's leading up the genetic uh, biodiversity network of the Human Cell Atlas. Um, and these are four axes of diversity that, uh, that the group is focusing on um, in that. And then I'm a member of that group, as is Sophia. Um, and these are genotype, ancestry, sex, and geography. And they matter because we know that they matter um, uh, because we see, we observed population-specific genetic risk variants. There is uh, evidence and for ancestry-specific drug metabolism, for geographical, for sex-specific drug response, and geographical differences in incidence of disease, whether it's malaria, uh, breast cancer, and so on. And lack of attention to this diversity, as was brought up yesterday, leads to healthcare disparities. So for a long time now, we've been talking about the need to increase uh, diversity in our samples and to sample diverse ethnic groups as a priority. So many people have seen this graph. It's the graph of uh, GWAS studies. Um, and this is, again, Shyam's slide, and he asked, is it getting better? So as you can see, back in 2011, the studies were 86% European. What you can see in the recent studies is we're starting to see an emergence of <clears throat> populations spanning different ancestries. But what Shyam did is ask, is it proportionally different? And it's not. We're actually still at 86% European ancestry in these studies, even in the recent ones. And this motivated me to take a look at GTEx, which turned out to be 86% European ancestry as well. But here is where it is making a difference. This is data from the Human Cell Atlas, uh, from the uh, data coordination platform and the cell by gene. It's PBMCs, so blood-based data sets. And here you can see it's down to 65% European. And you can see an increase in data sets um, from China, Japan, India, Korea. And these are data sets that are part of deliberate funding to that HCA Asia um, cohort um, that Shyam and his colleagues are working on and he can talk about later. So clearly we need more funding for these cohorts outside the US and Europe if we're really going to impact this diversity issue. This, as I said, is largely blood studies, but CZI has also recently funded what, the, what are called the ancestry networks for the human cell atlas. And again, we know, we saw yesterday in the Latin American presentation that they have one of these. Uh, Sophia, my colleague here, also has another one, um, and she can uh, talk about that later. So these are starting to get at tissues as well. And with that, I'm going to finish and take any questions, and um, thank you. Thank you, Kristen. That was a great, um, great talk. And so I'm just scanning the room to see if we have any questions to 
start off with? And do we have anything online? And of course, welcome to our online um, participants who I forgot to greet earlier. But great to have you all with us. Uh, nothing online yet, but we will also have opportunities to ask questions to Kristen on the panel. And maybe in, in the interest of time, we can, can keep on moving. Speaker. Thank you, Kristen. Great. Thank you, Kristen. So uh, it also gives me great um, pleasure to introduce Dr. Tuli Lapalainen, who is here to give us a body map pitch. Dr. Dr. Lapalainen is a professor at KTH Royal Institute of Technology, the director of the genomics platform and the national genomics infrastructure of SciLife Lab in Sweden, and an associate faculty member at the New York Genome Center. She received her PhD in genetics from the University of Helsinki, followed by a postdoc at the University of Geneva and Stanford. Her research focuses on functional genetic variation in human populations and its contribution to human traits and diseases. She's a recipient of the Lena Peltonen Prize for Excellence in Human Genetics and the Harold and Golden Lamport Award in Excellence in Basic Research. Dr. Lapalainen is co-leader of the Body Map Working Group um, together with Dr. Agli. So thank you, Julie, and we're looking forward to this pitch. Thanks, uh, thanks, Nikki, and, and thanks for thanks for having me here and, and uh, allowing me to present on behalf of the body map um, team um, our some pitch for this multimodal and multi ancestry cell and tissue map. So um, I want to kind of like start with what we would hopefully end up with. Basically, what would body map hopefully deliver to the scientific uh, community? So um, I don't really need to reiterate the, the, the general uh, variant to function challenge that is, I think, now emerging as probably the biggest uh, challenge in human genetics, interpreting uh, GWAS variants and other genetic associations to human, human diseases and, and traits. And what BodyMap wants to do is to um, identify and, and characterize functional effects of uh, genetic variants, disease and trait associated genetic variants, discovered in diverse uh, populations. Um, characterize how these affect molecular processes in the cells, focusing on the native tissue context and cells, cells in tissues. Um, BodyMap also wants to um, characterize how these um, cells in their tissue context relate to uh, model systems, so, so in vitro uh, tissue cultures, organoids, etc., and, and better understand this, the sort of like um, applicability of these, these model systems. And um, altogether, this would be achieved by, by creating a broad uh, reference data set and a, and a resource that serves research communities for multiple diseases and traits. So unlike some other uh, projects in, in ICDA and otherwise, BodyMap doesn't focus on any particular disease and trait, but aims to build a reference community that sort of um, further science ac across uh, diverse uh, fields. Um, and um, so what, what BodyMap is, is proposing to do here is collect a lot of tissue samples, characterize them uh, from a molecular, cellular perspective, of course do genetics. This kind of analysis is not, not really a um, novel, novel sort of study design per se. Molecular analysis of tissue samples has been a foundational building block for variant to function research for a long time with uh, the examples that Kristen mentioned and many others. However, these uh, previous and, and, and also ongoing efforts lack uh, some combination of, uh, first of all, scale um, and data that enables really genetic studies that, for example, the wonderful human cell atlas doesn't, doesn't really pursue. Um, most of these studies lack ancestral um, and or environmental diversity and global scope of sampling um, these, um, these tissues. Um, there are also studies that are more sort of uh, focused on a single or a couple of different tissues without this kind of generalizable multi-tissue scope that is relevant to mul uh, for multiple uh, clinical uh, phenotypes. Single cell resolution um, is, has, been, has been lacking for, for many of these studies, for example, uh, GTEx. And then the multimodal depth is something that very scalable assays are also really, only, only really starting to enable us to do um, around, around this time with many other previous catalogs focusing on, on just a few molecular phenotypes. So we feel that body map really fills a crucial gap by addressing these, these um, caveats in, in other um, um, uh, studies. 
And uh, then the question is, why now? Why is this the right time to pursue a project like uh, Body Map? And this is a combination of two things. So first of all, uh, we urgently need a resource like this. So as I already mentioned, variant to function challenge in general <laughs> looms large ahead of all of us. So there is, there is an, uh, an urgent need to create resources to, to um, uh, further, further characterize. Um, um, molecular and cellular effects of genetic variants. And as we have discussed during this meeting and in many other meetings, GWAS is diversifying. We have an increasing number of genetic loci discovered in non-European populations, and we have to make sure that we have the functional resources to actually interpret those studies. If we don't actually pursue this with, with ambition and, and with, um, with a determined push, we will end up doing all these GWASs and end up with hundreds and thousands of loci where we are kind of stuck with their functional interpretation. Um, and the, the other aspect of why, why this is the right time for body map is that um, it is feasible. Um, even though these needs have existed, let's say, five years ago, we are now in a much, much better um, uh, position to actually uh, successfully execute something like this. We will be able to leverage infrastructure from other major programs, such as the one that Kristen um, described, leveraging the protocols, logistics, LC framework, other, other um, um, uh, resources to do high-quality scalable tissue uh, collection. And then technology development, especially in the space of single-cell multi-omics methods, will really provide us with transformative improvement in biological interpretability of the data and really, really uh, make, make biological discoveries that, that, um, that make sense. So overall, this is an ambitious project, but, but it is also a feasible one, uh, leveraging technologies and capabilities really at the, at the cutting edge. So um, the body map uh, study design is, is one that focuses on sort of a, the creating a, um, a diverse general population multi-tissue um, resource. And this, this is a departure from the traditional study design. Um, so where you think that you might be interested in a given disease and you want to analyze it with some cases and controls, so you identify some sampling sites and you figure out you, how to collect some tissues and you collect those tissues and analyze the data, and then you are some someone else wants to study another disease, and you start the process all over again. And you end up basically analyzing individual populations and diseases one by one. The data ends up being highly siloed with super difficult integration across different traits and diseases and collections and tissues, etc. And then you also have a cumulative setup cost, where it's kind of like every, every single time you launch this kind of a study, you're a little bit sort of starting from the scratch. And BodyMap um, aims to build um, a set of um, reference samples, reference data in the spirit of common controls that has been so successful in the sort of GWAS uh, frameworks. Uh, so sampling multiple different tissues in, a, in, in global, global diverse sites, diverse uh, ancestries with a multi-tissue um, uh, focus. And then also a part of body map, uh, I'll talk about this in, in, in a minute, is also uh, creating some, some disease cohorts and tissue sampling from, from them. So this would result in an integrated multi-tissue uh, data resource and then also allow cost-effective extensions where one can actually build additional disease-focused studies on top of the body map uh, resource and, and um, leverage uh, that. So um, the body map sampling strategy has two components. So, um, f firstly, um, um, there would be um, a post-mortem multi-tissue collection, around 1,000 or so ancestrally diverse donors, but for feasibility reasons collected in, in, um, in the US or, or Europe, and this would be not focused on any particular phenotype, a little bit sort of GTEC style um, uh, sampling, sampling design to really get multiple tissues from each uh, donor. And then, in addition to that, um, uh, we propose a, a global collection of surgical uh, tissue samples in such a way that where we would have blood, plus typically one, sometimes maybe two tissues per donor. And sometimes these, these um, um, uh, would be done with a case control uh, study design, um, including sort of standard controls and then diseases of, of interest. And altogether, we envisioned that we would have around sort of 15 to maybe 20 uh, tissues altogether, around 4,000 donors altogether. So we would have plot from each donor to allow integration. 
and then for all the other tissues um, from a few hundred to up to a thousand or a little bit more uh, samples per tissue. And altogether, this would result in about 15,000 biospecimens in, in total. Um, yeah. Um, yes, and one thing that I should mention here is that um, we have actually done, or especially Kristen has done a lot of work to actually identify potential sampling, sampling sites, leveraging on previous resources. We're not exactly at the stage where we want to provide that list to, to you here, but we're happy to discuss, discuss those in further detail. We also have, have a draft of a tissue list um, that is based on sort of in interest and disease relevance and also feasibility of multi -omics. Uh, data, data collection, but I'm also not sharing that draft list here because then this always ends up becoming like a discussion of if anyone, everyone's favorite tissue is on that list, etc. But there is, there is quite a bit of sort of actual practical feasibility uh, sort of setup that we, we have already, already uh, put behind this. So to dive a little bit deeper into the post-mortem multi-tissue sampling component of, of the study design. So, so here, um, uh, rapid autopsies from recently diseased um, uh, organ, organ um, donors uh, would allow us to sample multiple organs and samples from the same donor, which has been very, very valuable in, in, in GTEx and, and other study designs. Um, the rapid tissue acquisition and preservation after death um, creates very high quality um, data. And then, as, as Kristen described, mapping the anatomical um, locations to, to a common coordinate framework would, um, would allow us to, to sort of like really characterize the tissues um, um, well in such a way that they are also comparable across the different samples and different individuals. From postmortem sampling, one gets larger amounts of material for various different assays. And then also from these donors, we would want to collect material that allows creation of, of cell lines that can then be further analyzed in, in vitro. And here, very luckily, BodyMath would not need to set up this complex type of sampling from the scratch, but we could leverage uh, networks um, that have been used for GTEx in the US, and then the Cambridge Biorepository for a Translation of Medicine would be a very, very valuable uh, UK resource. And these networks have set up SOPs, protocols, consents, uh, etc., for donor recruitment and sample collection. Um, the, the, the design here allows broad sample and data sharing, and then also prioritization of um, uh, different minorities to create an, uh, an ancestrally diverse um, uh, sample. The surgical oligo tissue sampling is, is something that we would want to also pursue due to some of the significant limitations of postmortem sampling. And probably the, the, the biggest hurdle here is that there are uh, cultures and religions where, where postmortem tissue sampling is simply not feasible. It's a, it's a no go. And thus, to be able to actually pursue global and diverse sample collection, we need to think of study, study designs that are actually uh, feasible and, 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 and how, we can, how we can study those populations um, regardless. Um, also, in postmortem sampling, this is, this is very expensive and logistically challenging, so getting very, very large sample sizes is difficult. And then postmortem effects is also something that, at least in some tissues, is, is problematic. So, having uh, complementing the postmortem uh, multi tissue sampling with surgical oligo tissue sampling from resected tissue collected, for example, during surgery or biopsy, would be very valuable. It'll give us additional geographical diversity. Um, create larger sample sizes, and then also in some of these study designs we would be able to collect not just sort of standard general population uh, controls, but also, also um, cases for locally uh, relevant uh, diseases. We would get more restricted uh, set of tissues from this uh, sampling. There is a number of tissues that really cannot be <laughs> uh, feasibly uh, collected in, in this way, and then sometimes the, the amount of material is less per, per specimen. And, and for this type of sampling, we would also be able to leverage and expand on existing resources, for example, those uh, set up by the Human Cell Atlas and, and, this, and the Ancestry Network uh, initiatives, and we've already heard from some of these uh, projects uh, during this meeting. Uh, just a couple of words about logistics and standards for, for sample collection. So, um, it is very important for BodyMap to create a resource that is broadly accessible. There are situations where biospecimen sharing broadly, globally, would be complicated, and thus we would want to pursue data creation in geographically distributed uh, hubs. 
Um, the data, however, should be available for sharing, and I have some, some content about that later. Um, standardization and sharing of tissue sampling and preservation SOPs is, is very important, not just for body map, but also for creating increased capabilities for, for tissue collection later on. Um, the metadata standards and the common coordinate framework are important for creating uh, a data set that, actually is, that we can actually integrate analytically. Um, um, a couple of words about a very important aspect, which is how BodyMap would benefit the donors and, and communities where these samples come from. Um, we would want to pursue a, a very ambitious community engagement uh, effort with meeting with stakeholders, community members, uh, donor families to establish trust, community-appropriate consent forums, and education awareness, return of results. And here we can also leverage previous efforts and, and guidance, for example, from HCA, and ICDA, CZI, Ancestry Networks, etc. And, and here we would hope that BodyMap not just sort of creates one, one, one sort of resource, one study that is, that is ethically done, but also advances gen genetic literacy and engagement in, in general, and also empowers further uh, research uh, studies, and, 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 and ends up resulting um, in, in real benefits to the participating communities. So to go to the assays, um, we propose a set of core assays that would be done on all the body map samples. This includes, of course, germline genetics, so genome sequencing, uh, transcriptome and chromatin accessibility analysis with cell type resolution, with single cell RNA sequencing and single cell ataxic. Um, for integration with previous um, resources such as, such as GTEx and others, and for splicing analysis, we would also want to do bulk RNA sequencing, and then basic tissue annotation with standard histology. And here, in addition to analyzing the body map samples, we would also want to apply the same set of um, assays to, to commonly use cell lines and other model systems, and also cell map uh, cell types, to really allow us to very carefully compare how cells in the native tissue context uh, relate to these uh, different model, model systems, and how, how, what are the differences, what are, what are the simil similarities, what are the applicabilities of those uh, model systems. Um, we would also want to pursue a set of targeted assays for a subset of samples and or molecules. These are often very important sort of readouts that are still, the technology might not be quite as scalable to really apply to all body map samples. But these would include analysis of additional genetic variation, uh, germline or somatic, analysis of the tissue in situ molecular architecture, for example, with spatial technologies, and also some tissue-specific readouts when, when relevant. And then further assays to analyze different types of cellular programs, from analysis of splicing to additional single-cell epigenomic assays, uh, proteomic assays of, of different types, and, and thus create uh, for further, further information about really deep characterization of the, of the cell and tissue samples. So this would all together result in a very, very uh, powerful, unique data resource that would empower diverse analysis. I'll talk about some of the analyses that we would want to pursue uh, uh, in a second, but, but this, would, this would be broadly available. And it is important for us that uh, the, even the individual level data would be accessible to qualified researchers all over the world. This could be a cloud environment type of a setup. And then summary data would also live in different types of browsers to serve diverse uh, research uh, communities. And, and we are in the middle of sort of discussing if, if we end up having pharma partners in BodyMap, what would be the exclusivity uh, models. And altogether, also this sort of uh, data production in local sites would increase capabilities of omics data production uh, globally. Um, so, um, a little bit about analysis outcomes of what, and, and the types of analysis that we would want to pursue. So, um, the, really at the core of body map, or sort of like the first, the first low-hanging fruit of analysis, would be um, mapping of multi-tissue cis EQTLs and chromatin accessibility QTLs with cell type resolution, including in these ancestrally diverse samples where we, we can capture genetic variation that, doesn't, that is not well represented in, in Europe. This would advance variant-to-function um, efforts uh, of GWAS loci from different traits and, and 
different ancestries. It would be really a huge boost to get that uh, sort of cell type resolution in molecular QTL mapping, which is something that has been a major limitation, for example, in GTEx data and other major eQTL resources. And, and generally provide improved resolution in fine mapping molecular effects in different cell types, different molecular phenotypes, with ATAXIC being particularly valuable, valuable additional assay here. For the more targeted assays, this would allow us to do cis molecular mapping for different types of proteomes, signal rewiring, other types of cellular phenotypes that is perhaps in a smaller scale, but this would provide novel, potentially informative modalities for um, B2F um, efforts. And then, uh, finally, um, we would be able to derive from, from these data different types of cellular and tissue endophenotypes that, that allow GWAS type of mapping. So, so looking at genetic variants for um, I mean, gene expression across the genome for transQTLs, uh, transcription factor activity, cell type composition, image-based tissue features, etc. Et there is some early success in this type of research, and, and, and I believe that this would be very powerful for identifying not just the sort of target genes and, and cis regulatory sort of mechanisms, but also moving, moving the needle further into, into understanding the cellular and tissue mediators of uh, genetic associations for disease. We shouldn't affect that, um, uh, forget that not all variation is genetic. Uh, we all love genetics, but there is also other things, uh, such as analyzing um, how molecular and cellular and tissue phenotypes associate to things like age, sex, ancestry, to really kind of characterize core biology of human diversity in a way that hasn't really been uh, possible uh, before due to the lack of data. And then some of the disease uh, tra traits and phenotypes captured by BodyMap would allow us to study disease processes and biology. Sometimes when there is uh, sort of case control study designs digging a little bit deeper into specific diseases, and then also with this more ad hoc captured donor phenotypes and general population sampling would also allow us to create hypotheses, create preliminary data about potential processes to, to pursue further. And then this comparison of body map characterized uh, cell types and tissues, uh, comparing those to cellular models would really allow us to analyze the applicability of in vitro models in functional follow-up experiments. And here, body map would create this sort of like a, like a range of like what is, what is the population variation in, a, in, in, in different molecular phenotypes and how do these model organisms relate to that. A um, um, couple of words about the, the research community that we hope uh, BodyMap would, would empower and build and, and, uh, and, and kind of put together. So we, we um, envision that in BodyMap, the analysis of local subsets of the data would be really driven by local uh, researchers, and then integrative analysis would be, would be done as a joint uh, global effort. And here, for example, the ICDA Global Equity Standard would be a very good uh, guideline to, to uh, follow. Uh, we would want to make sure that browsers, other sort of like resources that BodyMap produces are accessible for different, different user groups, not just sort of uh, computational biologists, and, and also uh, build uh, training and research exchange programs for investigators. And thus, we, we hope that BodyMap would not just produce sort of exciting science, but, but also advance state of the art in different fields, empower researchers locally and globally, and, and really sort of, yeah, enhance local expertise and global networks and thus also contribute to diversifying genomics workforce. And um, so what I have des uh, described here uh, in, in this set of slides is, is the core of body map as we, as we envision it at, at this moment. But the capabilities, resources, and networks, and data built by body map would also facilitate modular extensions that go beyond this core of body map with ancillary studies that would, um, it could include things like adding the new collection sites, um, uh, sampling additional donors in the existing sites, for example, sampling deeper into specific phenotypes could be a particularly valuable um, extension, sampling additional tissues, cell types, um, the analysis of body map cell lines in, in vitro, such as uh, this could be a very nice um, uh, kind of uh, uh, interface with cell map. 
additional assays on body map biospecimens, and, and then, of course, diverse computational analysis of the data. We feel that, that this would really kind of make future projects in this type of a space easier, cheaper, and with better global equity, and thus kind of move the needle in the research community in general, and really uh, empower diverse uh, cost-effective discoveries across many different, different sectors. Um, as I've already mentioned today, we would not want to do this from the scratch and in isolation. BodyMap uh, will leverage existing resources and SOPs as, as much as, as possible. Um, and then also when it comes to the different scientific questions that BodyMap will answer, this would be highly complementary to data from, from other efforts, and, and we, we see a lot of, lot of poten uh, potential for integration uh, there. A uh, quick slide about a very rough draft of a, of a budget. Um, so multi-tissue post-mortem donor uh, collection is, is expensive, so that's, that takes uh, substantial resources. Multi-omic data production, of course. And then, then some sort of like a rough uh, price tag for a, a project coordination, data storage management, data and, um, analysis, training, and, and such, such efforts. This is probably on the lower, lower end of, of what, what it would actually take to put body map together, but it's a, it's a starting point for, for conversations. And um, a quick draft of a timeline, we sort of um, um, plan on quite an ambitious uh, way to pursue this project, since we can leverage on previous, previous efforts to hopefully get things uh, off the ground quite, quite quickly, um, with sort of the year three uh, being, being the time, time point when we would ho hope to uh, release uh, the first, first sort of phase one uh, data sets, and, and then moving, moving over from there with data releases every maybe six to 12 months. So I'll, I'll just finish with a summary of outcomes. So uh, body map would obviously result in, in important scientific discoveries, especially in the variant to function space for, for Chiwa's interpretation, leveraging diverse genetic, genetic and environmental backgrounds. Focusing on cells in, in, in their tissue context would, would, would allow us not to just sort of characterize those tissues, but also compare those to commonly used model systems. And this sort of the study design with common controls would, would allow um, us to, to understand my, my multiple different uh, diseases and, and phenotypes with this sort of like generalizable reference data set. The resources and capabilities that BodyMap would build would be in the space of um, donor, donor recruitment tissue collection for molecular analysis, creating an, an accessible data resource for many, many diverse uses, and then also diverse the genomics uh, research uh, community and, and global networks. And I already mentioned the, the, the potential to facilitate modular extensions. We'll hear about disease map later today, but, but I sort of see body map as something that would build the sort of like the foundational layer that allows um, extensions to different, different diseases and phenotypes with, with greater ease and, and lower cost. I'll finish there and uh, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. So we have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, I'm going to scan the room, but in the meantime, Claire, I think we have um, something <coughs> from an online participant. Yep, so just a reminder to anyone who is joining us online, I think we had just over 100 folks join us yesterday. Um, you can go to slido.com, submit that winning code 5066, and you'll be able to give questions towards um, the speakers. So one person is asking, how can we get involved and collaborate to contribute to sample collection? Yeah, just reach out to us. So, so we're right now, Kristen especially has done a lot of work talking to different folks in, in different, different sites. And, uh, and um, yeah, so we're, we're open, <laughs> open for those kinds of conversations very much so. Excellent. Thank you. So we've got one question over there and then followed by one over here. Reclana. Ricardo Verdugo, uh, thank you for the presentation. It, it's, um, it's, a, uh, it's a great effort that's going to be started now solving a problem, but it's a little troublesome to see that all the multi-ancestry is going to be only focused on blood, which is the only one that's going to be multi-ancestry, unless we believe that by studying minorities in the United States and Europe, we solve the, the genetic diversity problem, which we, don't, we know that is not the case. Uh, so. I wonder if you could walk us through the first stages of your protocol uh, from informed consent, which I suppose 
that has to be done by the family members, and what are the key steps that, uh, that this project needs in order to have success that you don't think that is applicable to, to Japan or to Mexico or, or other places in the world that can only be done in the United States and Europe? Yeah, so we are actually um, hoping that, that some of the post-mortem multi-tissue collection could also be pursued in, in other places. It might be something that un unless there are sort of sites that already have existing sort of setups for this, that it will take a little bit more time to bring those, those um, efforts sort of like on board and up to speed. But we would absolutely be, be open for that type of sampling in, in other sites as, as well. Um, Kristin can probably elaborate there. But I want to mention that, that uh, the idea with the surgical oligo tissue design is not to collect only blood. Blood would be just because that's something that we can actually get from everyone. But then there would be from different sites um, one or two additional tissues depending on what, what, what is sort of locally relevant or what people are collecting. And uh, yeah, it wouldn't be only blood. Kristen, it, do you want to yeah. elaborate? Yeah, I would say it, it, we would probably exclude a site if it was only blood because only blood is possible now. But we've been talking with, uh, uh, you know, Andres about the, your Latin American genomes project, and Shyam here for several Asian sites, Sophia and others spanning Africa and the Caribbean, and and the goal is to collect tissues. Uh, in some cases, it's just a tissue or a tissue type plus blood. In some cases, it could be two or three tissues, but the goal is really to have a tissue focus. It's just those tissues will be not entire across the body tissues for the most part, just because of the way the sites are set up. Yeah, yeah I understood that, but it's just that those still are not going to be multi-ancestry because it's one tissue in one site. Uh, so the only, the only multi-ancestry data set is going to be in Europe and, 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 and the United States. So that's, I, that, that was, I was, that's why I was wondering whether, what are those key steps that you've seen that, so that we can work on those, maybe so that we can participate in other parts of the world. Do we want so to allow us? Can I uh, propose that we hold this question for the panel discussion yes. and, and wrap up here and then come back to that because we do have a question on this side of the room. If we can just, and then we can come back to that um, in the panel. Is that fine? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, Lisa Strug, University of Toronto, Hospital for Sick Children. I mean, this is such an important project, so thank you very much. And I know, I mean, historically, we've all used this when we're studying different diseases, and it's just been invaluable. Um, one question I have, and I, I mean, there's so many directions I'm sure that you could go, and I know it's very difficult. But, um, you know, of course, when we're doing GWAS, we don't really know if we find something, you know, uh, let's say even we know the, the gene and we know the tissue, um, and maybe we can even think that it's regulatory, but we don't know the timing. And so I'm just really curious um, whether you've thought about a way to integrate developmental time in this project. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, so there is um, actually a project that is already ongoing in these early stages that, that is going to address some of those questions. That is developmental GTEx, that is sampling from infants to adolescents with multi-omic um, uh, protocols and, and single cell protocols to, to yeah, basically analyze uh, yeah, molecular tissue variation uh, during human, human uh, uh, development. And I think that then if we are thinking about sort of like cellular development, and sort of like cell differentiation, etc. I think here uh, collaboration, integration with cell map would be very valuable. Like in, in sort of like tissue sampling, it is very difficult to capture sort of like, I don't know, trajectories of neurons differentiating and those types of um, effects. So, so the, there would be sort of com complementarity in, in that sense. Marvelous. Thank you very much, Shili, and uh, thank you again to Kristen.